Hello and let's talk about IPL 2020. The governing council of the Indian Premier League met on Sunday and the big news is that the tournament is on. It will be held in the United Arab Emirates from September 19th to November 10th. Eight teams will be playing in the tournament. The women's IPL will also be held at the same location. A lot of effort is being put in to figure out the right procedures considering the health risks posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is of course the first major tournament in cricket after the pandemic broke out. We spoke to Leslie Xavier on some of these issues. Thanks, Leslie, for joining us. So the IPL Governing Council met yesterday and the big news is that the tournament will continue as planned. It will be a 53-day tournament like you were talking about. And this is a big news for cricket fans, of course, but also a lot of questions regarding how it is going to be held, the safety precautions, and what will be the kind of audience that is going to be participating in all this. So could you first talk about some of the big takeaways from the meeting? Yeah, so the uh, date has been finalized, uh, September 19 to November 10. Uh, the, the tournament is going to end midweek. I mean, swerving away from the norm, that is that the finale was always reserved for weekends. So there's a reason for that. I mean, let's just get into that to start with. Uh, India's, there is a tour that has been planned for the Indian cricket team to Australia. Uh, speculations are that the... I mean, IPL window was open because Australia pulled out of the... I mean, in the sense, understandably, uh, expressed apprehensions, apprehensions that they won't be able to stage the World Cup, the T20 World Cup. So, the, that window was open and IPL is, uh, is utilizing that. Uh, so, the BCCI had al already made a commitment to Cricket Australia that they would send the team for a, for a tour down under in December. So, for the tour to materialize, the teams have to travel much in advance to follow the quarantine protocols and all that. So, if the final is held on this, despite broadcasters wanting so that the final should be held a week later, that is the Diwali weekend, number 14 being Diwali, BCCI stood firm because of this travel logistic issue that they would face traveling to Australia. So that's that's how, as far as the schedule and the dates are concerned. And apart from the schedule as such, there is also a plus point. Uh, I take a plus point takeaway from the from the meeting. The women's IPL will be staged this year, just like last year. It would be a four-team affair and uh, a shorter affair. First uh, week of November, it would be staged, but uh, a good move nonetheless because considering the prevalent circumstances and the logistics and the different difficulties involved. BCC could have easily ignored the women's game, but they are doing it and that's kudos to them for uh, doing this. Uh, considering the fact that just like the men, the women are also have not played, not gotten a game. Uh, so this, this is a, a very positive move. And other than that, the big speculation that was doing the rounds about banning of the Chinese sponsor, which uh, which is the title sponsor for the IPL, Vivo Mobiles. Uh, BCC is sticking to all the sponsors, existing sponsors. Uh, obviously, it would have been quite a nightmare for the legal team to deal with all these things at, at this juncture. Right. So, Vivo would be the official sponsor and uh, the teams are uh, set to travel after 25th of this month. So, uh, more or less, the news is that most of the teams would be in UAE by uh, 30th and they would undergo the necessary quarantine period which the UAE government would, would stipulate and then uh, they would be put up in their hotels. At, uh, as we speak, the BCCI and the IPL teams are consulting specialists to implement that eco-bubble, the bio-bubble bio -bubble, right. kind of a uh, uh, setup just like what we saw in the England versus West Indies series. So, uh, teams would, but unlike that series where the matches were held at, at venues which also had a hotel facility, it's not it's not there in the UAE. And so, teams would be required to travel from the hotel to the stadium. So, what the, what the IPL has decided is that they would hold the matches only in two stadiums in the UAE so that the travel is minimized. Uh, the evening match would be held half an hour ahead of 
what is the norm usually it used to start at 8 pm now it would start at 7:30 uh, pm right. that has got to do with the broadcast dynamics because considering the time differential in uae and here then it makes sense uh, more than more than the safety protocol i'm saying and there would be 10 double headers through the course of the 53 days uh, amid simultaneous matches and uh, then of course the knockouts and the final right. and uh, uh, as far as safety protocols are concerned getting back to that so uh, consultants have been roped in and also bcci would put in place a medical team ready to move in and intervene uh, if and when or uh, i mean god forbid but if 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 some of the players or some support staff or whoever right. gets get i mean start showing symptoms or get i mean uh, there would be continuing continuous testing through the course of the mm-hmm. tournament so in case medical intervention is needed that uh, for that there would be a team in place as well right, right. So, in this context, a uh, couple of things. One, of course, is the question of the audience or the spectators as well. I understand yeah. that at least initially there is no plan to uh, let uh, spectators and audience in. And secondly, in this context, also, uh, how, uh, considering the global scenario, how prepared do you think we are in terms of safety precautions and stuff? Because, like you mentioned, there have been one on one matches, say, with England and West Indies, for instance, but this is probably the first real tournament happening in cricket with so many teams at the same time. Uh, so, uh, we can, uh, we, because, see, uh, in cricket, yeah, sure, there was only bilateral series that has happened. Now, as we, I mean, the England versus Ireland series is happening. After that, England versus Pakistan will happen. So, uh, but in other sport, and that to contact sport compared to cricket, in football, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, Japan and uh, Korea and all that, baseball has started and football again started. Chinese Football League started last week, so, I mean, where the entire pandemic thing began. Sport has begun, be, begun there. So, uh, and so there have been, uh, that's why BCCI is roping in experts from outside because people who have the, have the experience of, of organizing right. big sport at a large scale. So, when you look at uh, the uh, matches of the English Premier League or the Spanish League that took place or the German League and also now next week onwards the UEFA Champions League, the pending matches from the round of 16 onwards would would begin. So, all these are huge. uh, I mean, in that sense, the number of teams involved are large. I mean, larger than IPL if you look at the leagues, football leagues. So, Norms have been established and uh, it's just a matter of putting things in place and I mean bluntly put it's just a matter of spending the money at the right place. So there is a huge uh, reputation I mean uh, not just I mean money is at stake for sure and also reputation of the game of of BCC as organizers of, of big sport it's all at stake here. So I'm sure the board and the IPL governing councils, as well as individual teams, would 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 put in all the effort, all the resources into ensuring that at least the protocols are set. But as we know, this this is I mean, is it, it doesn't follow any protocols of its own. So yeah. it's it's always a risk. There will always be risk factors. So uh, IPL have uh, put in contingency. Uh, plans in place for, for such situations, for instance, changing of players. I mean, there are 24 players that have been appro- approved for a team, plus plus whatever uh, I mean, support team that, that they would be entitled to. And beyond that, if at all, through the course of the tournament, uh, some, some, uh, some players test positive, then they would be obviously quarantined, hospitalized or whatever. And at the same time, there is provision to replace those players. But again, it's not as simple as one player getting infected, and yes, yes. because because things could escalate. So that's a real risk. That and uh, let's see how it transpires. Because uh, already things are put in place, so we can all, only hope that no mishaps happen. Because I mean, players getting infected and. Uh, Things going haywire, all this would would ultimately cascade into a, 
a situation where the impact would reach everywhere, including back home in India, because that's how the finances of of the cricket establishment or or, or the IPL work. So uh, a cascading effect will happen, and also that would deter other smaller sport in the country from mm. starting. So that's also a big deal because if if uh, Olympic disciplines such as athletics or boxing or weightlifting or any any sport for that matter, if they if they are mulling. And then suddenly they are waiting and watching. See, let's see, cricket is starting. Let's see how how things transpire there and all right. that. And if some mistakes have happened, then that that would affect Indian sport on a larger scale as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Leslie, for talking to us. Our next segment is around about the national education policy. The NEP was approved by the government last week and proposes some major changes to education in India. This is true of both the school and the higher education sectors. In higher education, perhaps the most significant measure is the merging of the UGC and the AICT to form the Higher Education Commission of India. Other aspects are the removal of the MPhil degree, greater scope for private players, and the introduction of a four-year degree from which students can leave at any point. We talked to Abba Dev Habib, the treasurer of the Delhi University Teachers Association, on the implications of the policy and why teachers groups are opposing it. I wanted to begin by asking about the general direction or the general trend of this policy itself. We know that the right wing in India has been very keen on influencing education so that it can push its ideological agenda. So overall, what is the direction of this policy? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, the cabinet note which has been passed and which was uh, posted on MHRD website only yesterday morning, uh, we saw it, uh, is based on 2019 draft education policy. And we see that uh, this uh, policy document uh, is, is going to lead to extreme centralization and commercialization of education. And while in uh, whatever is written may look like, uh, you know, um, that we are mo moving towards something, but finally the implementation will lead to extreme commercialization of education. And that is why students and teachers have been opposing it and on the both 2016 draft inputs to draft new education policy 2016 and 19 there has been lot of uh, agitation by students and teachers and a uh, lot of feedback was given on the draft new education policy 2019 what we are finding extremely upsetting is that uh, while uh, universities and schools have been locked down uh, because of the covid situation uh, the government is passing a very important document document uh, which is going to affect each and every household this is not the time to push a new education policy uh, you know it is very interesting that uh, i was looking at um, uh, one of the tv programs where they say that you know rte act 2009 will now be implemented from age 3 to 18 and this is a very big step and this is very good uh, I went to a TV program uh, recording where ABVP person also claimed this. And this was based on the document which was available in the public domain on the, on the day a uh, cabinet note was passed. So something which was circulated was called NEP, uh, Final for Circulation. Okay, this is 60 page document. And rightly so, on page number 29, 8.8 .8 clause, it says that RTE Act uh, will be implemented for all the um, uh, children from age 3 to uh, 18. And this looked like a, a, you know, a very important thing. And yesterday, I saw a RTE activist saying that in the final thing, which is there on the MHRD website, this clause has been dropped. Now, this is how this government works. On the day a cabinet passed, there was this 60-page document which was circulated. And that is the uh, document which was with the reporters. That was the document which even ABVP was quoting from. And then on um, uh, yesterday, the MHRD site showed an, another document, which was 66 page. Okay. And that in clause 8.8, .8, RTE word has been dropped completely. The government is completely silent on what will happen to RTE Act. Will it be there at all? or whether that has been also repealed. Right. And uh, the whole idea that it will be there for 
uh, for all children from age 3 to 18 has been completely dropped. RTE word has been dropped. If you search the document for RTE. So this is the gap and um, uh, which this government will have even on right. the written document and what, what will be implemented. Okay. Uh, so this is, a, a, you know, I was uh, aghast because no government should do this. I mean, how do people believe you if uh, your documents can change overnight? So the other key question to start with uh, when it comes to higher education is there is a lot of major changes that have been proposed. And one of the key changes is that <clears throat> the UGC, that is the University Grants Commission, which used to regulate higher education is being scrapped. The All India Council of Technical Education is being scrapped and there's a new body yeah. that is going to be coming into place, which is called the HECI. Now, uh, this comes along with uh, changes in the <clears throat> structure of education itself. The MPhil degree is going to be removed. The bachelor's degree is going to become a four year degree and students can opt out at any point of time. And all of this has been given this progressive uh, you know, framework of it, students having more choice. But in reality, what will be the implications of this? See, on the issue of uh, a repealing of uh, uh, University Grants Commission, I want to say that this is not the first attempt. And if you remember, uh, in UPA's two time, uh, there was a higher education research bill which wanted to repeal. And again, um, you know, club uh, merge, UGC, AICT, and the National um, Teachers Education Council, National Council for Teachers Education into one um, a body. And uh, that attempt was also stopped through the Rajya Sabha. Uh, the bill could not pass through Rajya Sabha finally. And uh, in this Modi government also, we see that an attempt was made even in 2018 to repeal all these bodies to bring them under, uh, uh, again, Higher Education Commission of India. And that was again shelved because of the constant opposition of uh, uh, coming from educators and uh, from across the country. Mm -hmm. See, the problem uh, which we see is the single window of negotiation. It is a case of extreme centralization. And without saying that why just merging of these bodies will result in something better is beyond our comprehension. Uh, there is no study to say why UGC has failed and what is needed to strengthen it. It is important to find out the loopholes and see whether within the existing framework that can be done or not. And we see that all these bills do not provide, uh, the earlier attempts also did not provide a framework, a, a study uh, to say how repealing them and replacing them will help uh, to overcome the shortcomings which exist today. On the four-year undergraduate program also, I want to say, that uh, you know delhi university has been treated as a, a lab for experiments and during upa2 in 2013 four year undergraduate program was imposed and a similar kind of framework where it said that student will have choice and the choice is that they can exit exit after one year or two years or three years or they can complete four years of undergraduate program and we see similar recommendations coming right now and I see that, you know, a um, uh, few things here, that if you have a common structure, which allows multiple exit point, then uh, educators will tell you that this cannot be done because a framework, the coursework is made thinking about the length, the duration of the coursework. You cannot have such a flexible system. It is possible that the university offers courses which, are, which run for a year, which run for two years, or courses which run for three years or four years but to have all of them together in one framework means that you have a very loose kind of uh, coursework where you waste uh, the time of the student and this has already we have experienced this in FIUP where the first year was made completely useless it was rendered completely useless and any certificate coming out of that certificate after first year exit would mean nothing in the uh, you know, for as far as employability is concerned, it will not mean anything. The two-year thing coming out of the same coursework would also not mean anything. Yet, but the impact was that you were wasting a student's time when the student would have completed four years. First two years were completely lukewarm, uh, settled with meaningless courses. And this is 
um, the mistake which we are going to repeat again. If we want the same coursework to uh, give you multiple exit points. Uh, so uh, the one, this is wastage. The other thing which I want to say is that it is in these things you see that uh, this document is actually about exclusion and not inclusion. Uh, because if you have a framework which creates a hierarchy of degrees, you know, same coursework, um, providing three different degrees, I mean, three different, uh, um, uh, you know, certificates or diploma and then a degree, then the hierarchy you are setting up between these, um, uh, you know, degrees which students can get. And therefore, uh, over time, the market will demand uh, that the student should have completed four years if it was possible. And therefore, you will uh, leave the certificate course coming out of the same coursework uh, framework um, uh, rendered useless. You will also have second two-year diploma course coming out of the same structure, useless, and the three-year. So, and also we look at the uh, situation around us. We see that, you know, today, but when we calculate the expenditure towards education, we should not only look at what the student is paying in terms of fees. Uh, maybe in the public um, funded universities like Delhi University, JNU and all, um, uh, the student pays very less fee towards um, education. But for Delhi University, you will also have to look at how much money the student spends in living in a city like Delhi. You have, we have to understand that state universities have been um, a sort of marginalized completely because uh, their funding has been reduced, the states do not have funds to give because the teaching posts have been kept vacant. And uh, therefore, students have to leave their hometowns and come to uh, a city like Delhi and stay here. Now, therefore, the expenditure of the student in trying to live in Delhi, uh, the expenditure towards rent, towards food, all that has to be seen as a family's expenditure towards education. Right. So when you are adding a fourth year, and which will soon become a necessary thing, you are asking parents to spend more towards education. And therefore, when students experienced FYUP and saw that the first year was completely useless, and for, it is for this kind of year that the student is made to spend extra, there was a revolt by the students. And it is really, uh, you know, what can I say? I mean, um, irony that, you know, it is a big responding to the popular movement by students and teachers of Delhi University that when uh, BJP came into power in 2014, uh, Smriti Irani as an education minister took the call and set aside FYUP for Delhi University. Today, they want to impose it on the entire country. I want to understand with which, what wisdom. And also earlier, it is during UPA 2's time, whether it is about foreign universities, whether about other bills, it is along with the BJP that other people, uh, the left, of course, was opposing, but even BJP helped to stop these bills. Today, when they are running the government, they want to bring the same draconian um, um, uh, sort of policy uh, um, on education. But one thing which is a change scenario is the following that today when the parliament is not in session, a big, huge change is coming for the education sector. At least in UPA 2's time, uh, the processes were there and we could uh, enter those statutory processes as stakeholders, we could voice our concern as a uh, university community, which we, we had a greater handle to uh, voice our concern. Today, uh, that freedom has been taken away. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back with more news from the country tomorrow. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.